Hello, so our topic of discussion today is topic six, linear bounded automata and context-free grammars. Okay, so first, um, let's set up a little bit of context uh, with what we've, we've looked at so far. Um, we have, um, we have uh, studied uh, finite automata and push down automata, and then finally, more recently, we just saw uh, Turing machines. Okay, so in this context, what are we talking about when we talked about linear bounded automata? Um, so, um, so just as a reminder, uh, you remember the finite automata um, don't have a stack. And uh, the PDA, we add a, a stack, a kind of um, memory, but um, which is limited in terms of um, where you can where you can go and what you can access. And uh, the Turing machine finally is um, uh, able to access any location on the tape so it's like the, the stack is now available um, i mean the whole stack is available if, if you want uh, so it it, it what's uh, add um, more power uh, you have a head here and you can access any any location on the um, the tape okay we don't call it a stack anymore we call it a tape and um, the head can go uh, right or left to access any location and the tape has infinite memory. Okay, um, so that's that's a Turing machine and we've seen that in the previous um, topic. Um, now, uh, I think you notice that uh, in computing theory, uh, researchers and uh, people who study this field love to find um, new subdivisions of these areas, right? Um, just the same way uh, we got really excited by finding out that um, a PDA uh, can be deterministic or non-deterministic, uh, and the regular non-deterministic is the PDA in general, right? And that actually uh, one is not equivalent to the other, and a PDA cannot be reduced to a deterministic PDA um, in general. And, um, and so this led to uh, um, a class of language here that is a subset of uh, this class of language, right? Um, so that's kind of um, what we do in this field a lot, right? Is to figure out, okay, what kind of restriction or condition can I um, add to my automaton or my machine so that I can discover a new class of language associated with it, a new class of computation, uh, of computational power um, that is consistent and, and meaningful. Uh, and so for Turing machine, we can ask the same question. Is there a way to uh, divide a Turing machine into, um, into a subset? Um, and uh, well, we could look at determinism. Uh, we could look at determinism, uh, but We saw last time that uh, determinism doesn't change anything. Determinism or non-determinism doesn't change anything. We saw last time that if you have um, a deterministic or non-deterministic Turing machine, it actually amounts to the same computational power. Um, and to see more on that, you can you can look the previous look at the previous video. So no, that's that's not going to work. Uh, determinism is not uh, an option for um, dividing. Um, for a restricting Turing machine in some sense. Um, we could look at, um, well, limited, you know, limited access to memory to the tape, um, the memory, uh, but that would amount basically to returning to the state of a stack where you can just uh, push down and pop, right? Um, so that's that would be a PDA. So that's that's not what we want, right? We we don't want PDA. We already know that PDA. Uh, we're not creating anything new by doing that. What we could do, however, is limited memory, and that would work. And that's what a linear uh, bounded automaton is. It's just a Turing machine with limited memory. Um, so um, how does it work? Well, it's really uh, the same idea. So um, Turing machine then can be divided into, um, into well, divided in some sense. I mean, you're going to have the Turing machine with uh, unlimited memory and you're going to have the linearly, linear bounded automaton 
um, or more precisely, we should say linearly bounded automaton. Um, and um, um, the idea is that um, you have the head, right? And the tape. Now, instead of having uh, unlimited memory that way, right? We actually bound the memory, the tape, uh, by the size of the input. So you're going to have your input here and uh, a bracket here and here that just um, uh, limits the uh, capability of um, the moving tape, right? So the moving tape can still access uh, right and left, it can still access any point uh, in the memory. But um, once it's it's here, once it's here, uh, it cannot go further, right? Uh, uh, here a right will amount to, um, if you do a right when you're here, it will amount to the stay put, right? And um, there is a version of the Turing machine with the S stay put, it's not in the standard version, but that would amount to the same thing here. And same thing here, if you try to go to the left, it would amount to stay put. So you cannot, you just, it just doesn't move, right? You can, it's, it's licit to do a right when you're here, uh, with the uh, LBA, but um, it won't do anything, it won't move, right? So basically, uh, you cannot access anything here and you cannot access anything here, okay? Um, so uh, that's what the LBA is in a sense. So it's very simple. It works as a Turing machine apart from this condition. Um, and um, the question we can ask is, uh, well, why is uh, LBA interesting? Why, why adding this condition? It, can, it's, it seems kind of uh, an easy restriction, so something that kind of makes sense, but still it's, it's important to try to figure out what, what, why, okay? What are the interesting points? Well, um, the first thing to notice is that um, it, um, it defines a new language. Just this in itself is, is interesting, right? Uh, we have a new language, a new class of language, more precisely. that we call uh, context-sensitive languages. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll see more about that uh, a little bit later. Okay, so um, just this in itself is interesting, uh, but we'll see why this, um, this class of language is particularly interesting later. Um, the second thing uh, that is um, actually very interesting and, uh, and uh, from a practical standpoint is that um, LBA is actually very much closer to uh, what our actual computers are, right? Um, um, LBAs are more or less uh, computers, right? Uh, the same way that, uh, well, uh, a Turing machine is more of, of a model of computing, of the process of computing, right? Uh, but um, Turing machine has infinite memory. Our computers don't have infinite memory. So um, adding the condition on a Turing machine that it has um, a limited memory, in some sense, is, is really what, what a computer is. So LBA, um, is very interesting and in just in the fact that um, we could say that it is a model of computers, of actual, um, you know, um, silicon hardware computer. Um, so that's, um, that's an, an interesting fact in itself. Another interesting fact is that um, uh, LBA uh, belongs, the class of language recognized by LBA uh, belongs to the class of decidable languages. Um, and we'll we'll talk more about the decidability a little bit later. It's its own chapter uh, because it's it's a it's a important uh, it's an important piece in this course. Uh, but that's another imp important uh, interesting fact. And the last uh, interesting fact is that we are now reaching our first um, um, well, it's a double double interest. Uh, we are reaching our first open question. In this course so far, we've seen a lot of uh, results. Um, and um, and nothing have been um, um, you know I, I, I talked in the introduction about um, some aspects of this course that are um, very intriguing and and also open for research question. Uh, well, here is one that is very interesting, and um, 
and and uh, it's really to the question of uh, determinism. And another interesting thing is that um, uh, determinism, um, an LBA is, um, so the, the last interesting fact is, is the, the following open question. Uh, LBA is defined standardly as non-deterministic, okay? Uh, now you remember for a Turing machine, determinism or non-determinism doesn't really matter, right? A, a Turing machine is typically deterministic in the way it's defined. But uh, if you add non-determinism, it doesn't change its computing power. Um, LBA, on the other hand, is typically defined as non-deterministic um, in its formal definition. And if you add determinism, well, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Um, it might change something. It might change something, uh, just like it does for PDA, right? Uh, and it's interesting because in some sense we are closer to PDA with LBA than to a Turing machine, right? So we, we can actually wonder, uh, does determinism change something? Are we defining a new class of languages? Well, we know, of course, that with determinism, um, you do not um, reach a higher class, right? Uh, a deterministic LBA will recognize everything that a non-deterministic LBA will, right? Um, so, of course, deterministic LBA will recognize everything that a non-deterministic LBA recognizes. The question is, um, is there, are there, um, you know, are they basically equivalent? Can you do the other way around, right? That is a big question. We do not know. We do not know. Um, we, we, we do not know. <laughs> so that's our first open question. So far, we've seen uh, a lot of things uh, that have been known for a long time, right? Uh, but some of them not so much, right? Um, um, Turing machine, known for a long time. 1936, a lot of results in the 30s and 40s. Um, so same thing for finite automata. PDA, well, there are things like, you know, that have been more recent, right? Uh, um, everything around deterministic PDAs um, and... and um, deterministic context-free grammars. Um, this, this is more tricky and, and some of the results are more recent, but still we're talking about multiple decades ago. Uh, here, think about it. We're reaching for the first time in our course, for the first time in our course, we're reaching an open question. A question has not been answered. We don't, we do not have the answer. Nobody has proved it or disproved it. Um, and when I say it, I'm talking about the question um, is a non-deterministic LBA equivalent to a deterministic LBA? Open question. So just for that, also LBAs are interesting. Uh, obviously, we know that it's not an obvious question. So so determinism, non-determinism, um, just um, is um, having an, an impact on LBA in a way that it doesn't have an impact on, on Turing machines. We already know that. Um, but we don't know if they are equivalent or not. Um, so um, in in... In other words, um, in, in um, the notion of the question of complexity, space complexity, I will see later, um, this question is also formulated as the following uh, in a more formal way. Um, N space for non-determinism space complexity of a Turing machine of o, o of N, order of N. So that means that um, that's, that's the the limited memory, that's the ELBA, um, uh, is it uh, equal to D space for deterministic with a space, a memory of, of the order of N? Uh, that's the question, right? We, we do not know the answer to that question. Okay. So um, I just think that's, that's something really worth mentioning. So here are very, four interesting uh, aspects of LBA. Um, now, um, the question that comes um, necessarily with the question of a new automaton, what do we have with a new automaton? We always have a new grammar, right? That's, that's what has been happening so far. So if I go back to um, our, um, I'm going to take another piece of paper here, I'm just going to cover that. Uh, if you remember to each of these, um, to each of these Automaton, automata, uh, we had associated certain grammar, right? Um, so uh, we have um, 
regular expression associated with uh, finite automata, uh, PDA or DPDA. We have the context, sorry, context free grammar. or deterministic context-free grammar, right? And uh, now the question is, well, what about Turing machines, right? Uh, we, we've not talked about the grammar associated with that, and of course there is one. Um, and um, and the, the same question will be for uh, LBS. So Turing machine, you can, you can see it as, um, you know, if we divide into LBA, Turing machine, it's our you know, subdivision. Um, uh, yes, that's not the equivalent grammar. Sorry about that. I'm just gonna here assume we have LBA here and Turing machine here. And what is the corresponding grammar, right? That's, that's, that's the question we can ask now here, right? Uh, let's start with Turing machine. Well, Turing machine is an unrestricted grammar. That's no surprise. We um, generate any. Um, we can um, we can generate any rules, right, for our grammar. So here we have uh, unrestricted grammar. We have unrestricted grammar. Uh, and um, and how can we just express it formally? Well, it's any alpha uh, produces beta with alpha and beta being um, any combination, you know, um, being any combination of um, um, terminals and non-terminals variables. Uh, so, um, so that's that's uh, that's an unrestricted grammar. You can have anything you want on the left side of the rule, and on the right side. And uh, this grammar is um, these grammars. Uh, these this uh, family of grammars are going to generate the language recognized by a Turing machine. Okay. Now LBA. What would be? Well, obviously, it's going to be something between uh, the context-free grammar and the unrestricted grammar, right? Context-free grammar is, uh, if you remember well, so regular expression, right, uh, will be of this kind of uh, format. Uh, context-free grammar will be of the format A produces um, Alpha with alpha being any kind of combination of terminals and non-terminals, right? And A being a variable, right? So on the left hand side you have only variables. That's that's how we define context free grammars. Okay, so that's of course much more restricted than this. Now LBA is going to be an in-between. LBA is going to be um, is going to be um, a context sensitive grammar. CSG, okay, for context sensitive grammar, CSG. And it's going to have the form alpha A beta, alpha gamma beta, okay? So that's, you can see it as the, the context, okay? And uh, we impose on uh, gamma that it is non empty. So you can see alpha, beta surrounding the A uh, and the gamma as, um, as the context, okay? So you can have now on the left sa hand side on the rule, all the things in just one variable. You can have multiple variables and terminals, right? Uh, alpha and beta can be any combination of variable and terminals. So you have here a, a great um, freedom. Now you could ask, well, what's the difference between this and this? Well, here, um, what we impose is that the notion of context is also, can also be interpreted as, as differently than as a context because this gamma has to be non-empty. Somehow we say, well, 
for the variable, for a variable on the left, you need at least one variable on the left, which makes sense. Um, you need at least one variable on the left. And for the variable on the left, you're going to have, um, you're going to have um, another one on the right that is non-empty. Well, in other things, what we, and, and, then, and then what's going to be the context around it is going to be the same on the right and the left. Uh, there's another way to express that, which is basically an equivalent uh, grammar, uh, is to express it as uh, what we call a non-contracting grammar. So a non-contracting grammar uh, is, is equivalent to a context-sensitive grammar. It just says that um, you have a rule alpha, beta, alpha, beta, just like for unrestricted grammar, the only restriction you put is that um, alpha is um, less or equal than beta. So beta has to be greater or equal than alpha. You, you, that's why it means it's, it's, it's called non-contracting, is that when you apply the rule, you do not contract, you do not get um, um, a sequence of terminals and variables that is shorter than the left-hand side of the rule. It can be the same or larger. It's non-contracting, right? So, um, in other words, um, you know, um, if you say a zero a, that that is not allowed, right? You cannot do that. Okay. Uh, you can do a, um, you know, a zero, a zero one. That that's fine. Okay, so um, uh, so that's that's the notion of non-contracting grammar. In some sense, this is a much easier uh, definition than this, uh, but they are both equivalent. So um, okay. So now, um, what about um, the um, what? What's uh, wh why? Why non-contracting grammar? And what's the relationship? Uh, what about the relationship now between uh, those grammars and um, and the uh, linear bound bounded automaton? Okay, so. Um, we're not going to show the equivalence and prove it here. That would be um, way too much for this this um, rundown. But uh, let me just um, give you the, the gist of it and, and the intuition. Um, what is a non-contracting grammar? Um, non-contracting grammar, we just said, is a grammar such that the rules don't contract uh, going from the left side to the right side of the rule. Now, if you remember what we said with a deterministic PDA, an automaton um, remember it goes from if you, if you try to do the parallel between an automaton and a grammar, right? Grammar the rules um, kind of go from the starting variable to the terminal. Let's call it Z or a string, right? You go from a starting variable to a string um, and through a multiple derivation, right? If you think the automaton, um, the automaton will do the um, reduction um, direction from a string, right? To, uh, to the starting variable, which is more or less an accept, right? So, um, so that's how you can, oh, I apologize. This is a little bit out of the picture here. I'm just going to move that, um, here. Okay. So, um, uh, the, uh, the automaton is really doing, uh, kind of the, the, the reverse direction of what a grammar is doing. And it's going from the terminals to the starting variable. And uh, it's really going in the reduction. Um, uh, direction, right? And we saw that it was important when we talked about the deterministic PDA 
to show um, how a deterministic PDA is equivalent to a deterministic context-free grammar and to, to show how a context-free grammar can be um, defined as deterministic, uh, we had to do this uh, reduction uh, direction instead of the derivation, right? So, um, so if you think if you think in terms of reduction, you're going from basically from um, from the right hand side of the rule to the left hand side. So instead of contracting here, if we're contracting in this direction, in this direction we're expanding. So you could say, well, a non-contracting grammar is in some sense a non-expanding aut automaton, right? You could say that a non-contracting grammar is equivalent to a non-expanding, because we're going the other way around, right? The grammar is going the sense of derivation, and this one is going the sense of reduction, non-expanding automaton, right? Well, what is a non-expanding automaton other than an automaton that has uh, limited memory, limited tape, right? A non-expanding automaton is really more or less this, an automaton with limits on the left and the right of memory, right? This is an LBA. So I hope this kind of makes sense to see the how a non-contracting grammar, which is equivalent to a context-sensitive grammar, is, um, the, um, is actually generating the same language that an LBA is recognizing. Okay, I hope this makes sense. Um, let's finish with a few examples of context-sensitive grammars. I mean, of, sorry, languages that are recognized by a context-sensitive grammar. Um, well, the first one that uh, we've, we've seen is not, um, is not um, context-free, uh, is this one, an, bn, cn, n greater or equal to 1. Uh, so um, you remember that this language is not context-free, but it is context-sensitive. So you can define it, you can generate it with uh, with rules like that, um, and and you can kind of see why, right? The context is going to be the a, the context of the number of b is going to be the number of a and the number of c, right? There is this idea. Um, another example that we've seen is not. Um, is not we've seen it is not rigor we've not proved it's not context free in our exercises um, but uh, but we could uh, this one is an example and uh, the number of a is two to the power of n it's neither rigor nor no context free it is, it is other, however context sensitive um, and uh, finally you could think of uh, natural language Natural language is um, very, very context-free, right? Uh, sorry, context-sensitive. If you think of um, sentences, I mean, we always know that the context matters, right? To, to know if um, how you're going to conjugate a verb, um, if you can use uh, the or a, right? You cannot say a cat's. Um, so if, if the noun is plural, you're going to be able to say the cat or cats, right? Um, but you cannot use a uh, with, with a plural. So um, this, the natural language is, is typical of a context-sensitive context language, right? Um, uh, it's, it's much closer to a context-sensitive language than um, to an unrestricted language, right? Uh, unrestricted, I mean, to a Turing machine recognizable language. So natural language uh, fits very well this um, specific subcategory of um, Turing machine recognizable languages.